We thank you for bringing us into your holy house that we may sing your praises, that we may fellowship together, that we may learn of you. Father, be with us now, and that the hearing of these words may our eyes be open that we may see Jesus. Lord, I pray that his meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So today we have a story of mistaken identity. Well, it's not exactly mistaken identity, it's confused identity. Or maybe it's misplaced identity, or maybe it's even misplaced intention. And have you ever had a, a case of mistaken identity in your life? Oh yeah? Oh, yeah? <laughs> How about a case of uh, mistaken intention? Yeah, okay. I may, have told, I may have told some of you this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> I'm going to tell it again because it's been a while and probably forgotten it. Besides, we're now talking to people in TV land, so we want them to hear the story too. We want them to hear just how confused your pastor can get. Well, this is a long time ago, a very long time ago. Well, I was serving in the church. Um, I was probably about 21, 23 years old. And I used to walk through the neighborhood a lot. You know, come lunchtime, I'd walk get my lunch. Get time, get come time at the end of the day, I'd walk to go home. I just walked a lot. I just did a lot of walking in those days. And I was walking down the street one day. I was walking down the street one day, and I saw, well, it's not politically correct to say this. There's no other way to say this, but it was a, a sweet little old lady. Somebody's mom, probably. Good mother's day. So somebody's mom, I had to be somebody's mom. I just wanted somebody's grandmother also. Just this sweet little lady. You know, she carried a couple big bags. They're kind of old fashioned brown grocery bags. I guess now they have those kind of earth bags, those kind of uh, recyclable bags. Those of you had brown grocery bags, just throw them away and we thought about that. Kind of have these brown grocery bags, she told me. She's kind of walking, walking along slowly like this, you know, kind of. She's trying to keep it around, feeling pretty good. I don't think too much of it. Until I see this big long black car. Big long black car, and it kind of comes up alongside or slows down. And there are these two guys, and they're big guys. One was about my age, and one of them was older. But they're both pretty big. And they slow down. I notice the woman looks over, and then she kind of looks over like this, and she starts walking faster. And the car starts driving a little faster. And now she starts walking her other fast. And the car is not as fast as, well, the car speeds up a little more. The younger of the two guys, who is not driving the car, jumps out of the car, jumps in front of the woman, and takes the two bags of groceries. And me, being 22, thinking I'm Superman, I am across the street faster Right. I'm across the street, and I grab that guy. I just grab that guy by his collar. And I'm about to do this. It's like, how dare you, you dare you? And all of a sudden, the woman shrieks. The little old lady shrieks. And she says, no, don't come take this, my son. Oh, God. Oh, I was going, your son? Well, we all had a good laugh over it because they all explained to me that, you know, she would sometimes get in a little, little tip of some kind. They were all shot and together, and she got to get in with them because they were telling her to hurry up. And she said, Well, fine, I'm just walking myself. And she was kind of stubborn, and she left, and they were trying to convince her, Don't walk by yourself. No, we're sorry, we're sorry. And she was being stubborn. But it was a case of mistaken intention. They weren't really trying to rob the poor lady's groceries. In fact, they were actually trying to make peace. They were trying to be nice. 
it was a mis case of mistaken intention. And fortunately, fortunately that was explained to me before I dislocated someone's jaw. Or considering there were two of them before they dislocated mine. Well, today we have a case of mistaken intention. The story tells us that these two, these two men, they're disciples. It says that they're disciples of Jesus. Yet they're not of the, well, formerly twelve, now eleven, that we usually think of as disciples. They're not part of the inner circle. They are, however, close enough to be concerned with things. One of them's name is Cleopas. In this particular text, it leaves the other one unnamed. The two of them, Cleopas and the other guy, are walking along and they are discussing things that have just happened. We're told that it's Sunday. It's the same Sunday when Jesus rose from the dead. They were walking away from Jerusalem. They were taking a seven-mile hike to Emmaus. And uh, someone comes up to them. Someone comes up to them and starts walking alongside them and says, what are you guys talking about? Now, we know who that guy was. That was, who was that guy? Jesus. Who was that man? Yes, it was Jesus. We know that. But they didn't know that. It says right there that their eyes were what? So if you look, their eyes were kept from seeing him. Their eyes were kept from recognizing him. They did not recognize him. And when he said to them, what are you guys talking about? They, they acted a lot like I'd imagine somebody, uh, oh, and September 12th. September 12th. A bunch of guys are all gathered around. And they're all saying, oh, this is awful. This is horrible. This, and then somebody came up to them and said, hey guys, what are you talking about? You, you know what happened, right? All those guys look. Where are you from? Where did you come out of? What rock did you just crawl out of under? This is pretty much how they look at Jesus. They said, what? Are you a visitor here? You're not from these parts, are you? You don't know what happened in the last three days. And then go ahead and they start to tell their story. Their eyes are downcast. Their eyes are downcast. They are upset. They are anxious. And they tell the stranger as they walk. They continue to walk with the stranger and they tell him what happened. And, and there's our first clue. There's our first clue. They say, well, you know, he was our leader. He was our prophet. And the government killed him. He was handed over by the church to the government. And the government killed him. But he was a prophet. He was mighty before God, man. And we were hoping that he would be the one to rescue our people. He would be the one to rescue Israel. And it's the third day. Now we have heard some strange stories, and we've heard from the women. The women said that, you know, they went there as this one angel, but you know how they are. Sorry, ladies, but they probably said something like that. You know how they are. Those women, they get so emotional, you know. And then we heard from Peter. I heard from Peter, and you know how he is. So we don't know. We don't know. They didn't recognize Jesus. We know that's Jesus. They don't know that's Jesus. And, and, and I submit to you, there's a real simple reason why they didn't recognize Jesus. They didn't recognize Jesus because the Jesus they encountered was not the Jesus they thought they wanted. Not the Jesus they thought they knew. Have you ever said that to somebody? Have you ever had someone say that to you? You don't really know me at all. Have you ever thought that? You don't really know who I am. You may think you know who I am. Just like I thought I knew who that guy was who was going to rob that little girl. Well, he wasn't. I didn't know him at all. And he didn't know me at all. You see, they were looking for a Jesus. They were looking for 
they pick on Jesus. They were looking at the Jesus who was going to kick out the Romans. They were looking at the Jesus who was going to be the new King David. They were looking at the Jesus who was coming with vengeance, coming with anger, coming with earthly power. And when they saw the real Jesus, they did not recognize him. And I'll just jump right into it. I'm going to say that's where the church is today. That's where most of the church is today. We are looking for a different Jesus than really is, in one fashion or another. So we're driving across the country. It's about 1,100 miles. And going down wasn't so bad. Going down wasn't so bad because the pastor got a left foot. But coming back up, we had an organ in the back of the car. Well, it was in a trailer, but it's a lot of weight, and it took a long time. But that's okay, because it gives you time to look around. And one of the things that I saw a lot of, I saw a lot of something, and it was disturbing to me. I saw a lot of billboards. Well, there are billboards with all kinds of things, and most of them don't disturb me. Billboards that say, you know, uh, you know, gasoline, you know, $4.15. Well, that kind of disturbs me, but nah, 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 nah. Oh, it disturbed me. But the ones that read Judgment Day, May 21st. Billboards that read Judgment Day, May 21st. You see, there are a whole lot of people right now, a whole lot of people who are looking for the wrong kind of Jesus. They're looking for a Jesus that wants to come to this earth and punish people. They're looking for the Jesus who wants to come to this earth and say, you're in, you're out. That's what we're looking for. And they have convinced themselves that this is going to take place on May 21st. On May 21st, they are convinced that Jesus is coming, and they're going to say, Norm, Norm, come on, buddy, you're in. All right, you're in. <laughs> Al, <Norm. laughs> sorry. That's the kind of Jesus they are looking for. And, and here's the thing. On May 22nd, on May 22nd, I'm going to be really heartbroken. I'm going to be really, really heartbroken because God's not like that. Because God is not about vengeance. God is not about punishment. God is not about anger. God is about reconciliation. God is about forgiveness. God is about not counting men's sins against them, but rather reaching out to them so they may have life and have it in abundance. And by the way, if you know anybody like that, if you know anybody like that, do me a favor. Just between you and me, a personal favor, please. Please don't say, I told you so. No. <laughs> Brother, you know what you can say? You can say, you know, God's not like that. God's not like that. God's not about that. God's about loving you. God looks at you and doesn't say, oh, I don't know, I'm not to judge you. There's someone whose sins, however many they may be, are already covered over. But I want to pick on Jesse. Oh, what should we call them? Neo Millerites. Neo Millerites. If you want to know what that means, look it up. I don't want to pick on the Neo Millerites. There's nothing to do with Miller Light, by the way. That's something else to add on the tape. Okay. Much of the Christian church, unfortunately, has the idea that Jesus is all about saying, okay, you're in, you're out. Much of the Christian church, unfortunately, has the idea, believe it our way, or you're in trouble. And, and, and I submit to you that that's not what God is like. So, Jesus is walking with these two men, Cleopas and his pal, and they, they uh, are listening to what he's saying. 
he, he chases them. It must be pretty gentle. You know, it, it sounds kind of harsh and tagged. He says, Ah, oh, you fools. You foolish people. But it probably was pretty gentle because they didn't, they didn't like saying, How dare you call us? I wouldn't even know you and walk away. They listened to him. So he chases them, assumably in a way that they can handle, and they stay and listen. And the text says he then begins to tell them everything in the prophets, going back to Moses. That's a long walk, that's a seven mile walk. They got some time. He goes and he opens the word to them. He starts talking about the prophecies that refer to himself. Um, what's interesting about that is they listen. They listen intently. They hang on every word. But that's not what they recognize him. They're listening. And, and I submit to you that's the second analogy of the church today. The second analogy with the church today. Our churches are full of the word. And I walk up and down our and we got churches everywhere. And I can almost guarantee you that every one of these churches have Bibles in it. We got Bibles in the pews, we got Bibles on the shelves, sometimes we've got Bibles going over the pulpit. And, and the people in the pews carry Bibles. And they know the Bible. But just knowing the word, yeah, it, it, it may sound blasphemous to you. Just knowing words doesn't necessarily mean you're going to recognize Jesus. Churches are filled with people who can quote words, filled with preachers who can quote words. And it doesn't necessarily mean you know Jesus. So Jesus himself is talking to these men, and they're listening to everything, and they're fascinated by it, and they love it. Their eyes are still closed. They don't know who it is who's speaking to them. And finally, they get to Emmaus. They get to Emmaus, and the stranger, that we know is Jesus, makes as if he wants to keep walking. You know, that happens sometimes, you know, you're walking with somebody, and they get to where they're, and he's got to keep going. Maybe he would have kept going, except they say something. And it's pointed what they say. It's beautiful what they say. So beautiful it's become part of our liturgy in the service of evening prayer. They say, stay with us, Lord. Stay with us. Not they say, Lord. But that now refers to, they understand he's a teacher. They understand he's a rabbi. They understand he's a preacher man. They don't know it's Jesus yet. So they call him Lord. They say, stay with us. Stay with us. It's evening. The night is almost upon us. All that lies. Don't travel now. Stay with us. And so he does. And then the next thing happens. He sits down and says, You look up. And I guess because he's the preacher man, because he's the rabbi, he has the honorific, the honorable position of breaking the bread. So he breaks the bread. He blesses the bread. And he gives it to them. Listen again. He takes the bread. He breaks the bread. He blesses the bread. And he gives it to them. And then their eyes are opened. It is in the breaking of the bread that their eyes are opened. It is in that action. Body of Christ. Body of Christ. Fellow members of the body of Christ. We unite ourselves. We take you, as we will next week, we take me. We unite ourselves with the broken, vulnerable, blessed, and given body of Christ. That is how we will know Jesus. Brothers and sisters, just knowing a bunch of words, you will not see Jesus. You will, however, see Jesus when you say, Stay with me. Stay with me, Lord. When you unite yourself to Christ's taking of himself 
allowing himself to be broken. God, Almighty God, allowing himself to be broken. Why? For the sake of the world around him. Allowing himself to be blessed for that purpose. Allowing himself to be given. In this way, in this way, those who deign to call themselves Christians can truly have their eyes open to see Jesus. When we unite ourselves with his vulnerability, when we unite ourselves with his blessedness, when we unite ourselves with his giving of himself to the world, there, there we will see Jesus. Amen.